budget clearly impacts the entire country, but it also impacts Maryland, sometimes in a disproportionate way, because we're right uh, in the back door of the nation's capital, of course, Montgomery County, uh, and Prince George's County and other uh, suburbs as well. So, uh, as I said, we're going to begin the budget process um, next week uh, in the House Budget Committee and the Senate Budget Committee will go forward. And then the week after that, we'll be on the floor of the House and, and Senate, I believe, for a full debate. Uh, and then by April 15th, uh, the House and the Senate are supposed to come together with their final uh, version. Uh, I'm glad we finally cleared away last year's uh, business uh, by making sure the Department of Homeland Security um, was fully funded through the fiscal year. That was an unnecessary uh, and purely manufactured uh, crisis. Uh, you know, the good news is that uh, the Department of Homeland Security is now fully funded. The bad news is that it's actually a cause of celebration, that the Congress simply did what it was supposed to do and keep the government agency uh, operating. And unfortunately, that's a sign of uh, the kind of problems we're seeing on Capitol Hill. And uh, the question is how that, that sort of whole sentiment uh, will unfold over uh, the remaining years. So with respect to the, the budget process, uh, as all of you know, right now we have in place these uh, sequester caps um, on spending. As you know, the Washington word is discretionary spending. All of you know what that really means is investments in our community, like in education, transportation, places like NIH. Um, and what the President has put forward in his budget is a budget that does not stick with these very tight spending caps that are, are restricting important investments um, in our national uh, areas of education and science and research and transportation and cuts that will have an impact on the state of Maryland. Uh, so he has proposed that instead of those very tight caps, that we increase our investment in areas like like NIH and uh, education by $35 billion, and it be matched by an increase of $35 billion in defense spending to make sure we maintain our readiness. Um, I believe that the budget that will be put forward by our Republican colleagues will not uh, include those additional investments and could very well dramatically cut the investments in the domestic areas, scientific research, education, transportation. Uh, we'll have to see how that plays out, uh, but if, uh, if those caps remain in place or if they actually propose to cut below those caps in important areas, it will, it will obviously hurt investments that help our economy grow and help more people um, around the country, but it could also have an impact, this portion of impact in Maryland uh, as well. So we're going to be uh, obviously working on uh, this going forward. As I said outside, it is a reflection, the budgets are a reflection of our values and priorities. You all know that. You make tough decisions. You made tough decisions during the economic uh, downturn, uh, and you make investments that are important to our community. So that's going to be the focus of uh, the budget uh, battle. Uh, I suspect they will also, as part of that budget battle, try and repeal the Affordable Care Act and dramatically shred the social safety net, things like food and nutrition programs, uh, as well as uh, Medicaid uh, spending. So I, I know you've always uh, been part of our effort to try and make sure the Congress does the right thing and look forward to working with you on that. So that's a little overview. Happy to talk about any local or national mm -hmm. issues uh, going Good. forward. I'd, I'd like to begin. I'm enormously interested in your experience in Cuba. I think it's very much to your credit that you were one of the really small exclusive delegation that was down there. I know how hard you worked successfully to bring our constituent Alan Gross home, and I just think it's fascinating, and I'd love to hear uh, any observations you'd like to share. What what conditions did you find when you went down there? Were you able to get out in the countryside at all, or did they just keep you uh, kind of cloistered, and um, where do you think things are headed on that issue? Well, thanks for, it was, thanks for asking. It was, it was a really emotional moment uh, to be able to fly down to, to Cuba uh, with Alan's wife, Judy, uh, pick them up and bring them home. Um, and I can tell you Judy, Gro Judy Gross's wife has spent the last five years uh, every day trying to make sure we got Alan home. And a lot of us have been working really hard for the last five years to bring Alan home. Every time I had the opportunity to talk to the President about a budget issue or some other uh, issue that was the main purpose of uh, discussion, 
we always parted by saying we got to get Alan Gross out of there. And there was a point where we actually had a chance, a number of us, uh, a couple senators and myself, uh, to meet with the president uh, about the Alan Gross case specifically, uh, which began to set in motion a process uh, that led to bringing Alan, uh, Alan home. So it was great to see him at the State of the Union address yeah. up with the First Lady mm -hmm. after having spent five years in a Cuban uh, jail. And I can tell you what was amazing to me is the resilience of Alan Gross. I mean, he lost a ton of weight. He lost his two front teeth. But um, on the airplane, when the president called him to see how he's doing, he was obviously hugely honored the president called. But he said, you know, you called me in the, right in the middle of my first corned beef sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, um, with res and, and the thing that is especially, uh, I think, important is in addition to bringing Alan home, it became the catalyst for changing what clearly had been a failed policy toward Cuba, right? I mean, we've had the embargo in place for over 50 years. The theory behind the embargo was that it would, uh, you know, drive the Castro brothers from power. Um, eight American presidents later, <laughs> Castro <laughs> brothers are still there. Um, of course, the Fidel's brother is in power. Um, and all we succeeded in doing, uh, in my view, was isolating the Cuban people and, frankly, providing the Cuban leadership with an excuse for why things were so bad. Because right. anytime someone complained about what was happening, well, you got the embargo, right, the Yankee embargo. So it was a failed policy, and the president was right uh, to, to change it. Now, this is going to be a long process, and um, I was pleased to be part of the first uh, congressional delegation to go back into Cuba. Uh, after the president uh, normalized, began the process of normalizing relations. And, uh, you know, we, I think the Cubans are, are very interested in uh, exploring a new kind of relationship. Um, and uh, the United States is obviously interested in pursuing a new kind of relationship. And, you know, we're hoping that uh, over time we'll open up more space in the Cuban private sector and that will uh, create more opportunities for uh, political reform. Nobody expects uh, dramatic changes overnight, but what we do know is that continuing to do the same thing we've been doing for 60 years <laughs> will not bring any change. Uh, and so uh, it, it was really exciting to be part of that process. And, you know, Alan Gross is a constituent. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that was, uh, it was, it was great to bring him home. And I had the chance to visit him on an earlier trip, I've been to Cuba three times now, an earlier trip with Pat Leahy where we uh, visited him in, in prison mm -hmm. and uh, he was looking pretty bad then. Mm -hmm. But what's remarkable, uh, remarkable is that Alan Gross uh, is now an advocate for the new relationship. I mean, you might think somebody who had been in prison for five years uh, by this, you know, Cuban government uh, would, uh, would be against any kind of open it. On the contrary, he agrees that it was a failed policy and he's interested in change. So I think in the days ahead, you'll probably hear more, we'll hear more from him about that. Chris, we talked uh, a lot about how you both tend to the national issues, take care of constituents. The Cuba situation certainly is one piece of that where you were handling foreign affairs, but actually taking care of a constituent at the same time. There's another example that comes to mind that you and I are working on right now, which is NIH, which you referred to. <clears throat> and NIH is a, is a great blessing for our community. But it's also a source of considerable amount of traffic on 355, which is not exactly a great place to add traffic. So they're going to expand their campus if you appreciate them. And they've agreed that for that expansion, they're going to go to a three to one parking ratio but they're holding to the two-to-one parking ratio for their existing facility. And as you also appreciate, our medical center across the way made a different decision, which was to go to a three-to-one ratio for all of their employees. So I do appreciate your willingness to work with me and with our state delegation to let NIH know that this is not okay, that they really have to make a, a better contribution to our community by aligning their parking ratios with the new federal standards. So I'm just grateful for how you handle both the big stuff and 
taking care of our people. Well, thanks, Roger. I mean, actually, this is a perfect example, right, of the intersection between the federal and the local, especially in this area where we have lots of federal agencies, which is great uh, for uh, the community and great for the country, but obviously needs to be managed in a way that, uh, you know, serves our constituents and protects local interests. So I'm looking forward to working with you on the parking, just like we work together uh, in this room to uh, deal with the expansion of uh, what is now the National Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center. It used to be, of course, Bethesda Naval. And interestingly, when, when that proposal came out of the BRAC process, uh, we worked very hard uh, to try to get federal funding to help with local traffic mitigation. And it was tough because it is not the policy of the federal government the first to provide any transportation. It was, the, it was the I believe, time. the first time <laughs> that the federal government actually put in, in this case, about $60 million in that thereabouts to help with the local traffic. And that's why you have some you know, road widening on uh, 355 and some of the other uh, roads around. We have the Metro underpass Sorry. that's coming as a result of that funding. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, that was tough. So thanks for uh, <laughs> mentioning. Uh, I, I worked very closely with um, former member of Congress uh, Jack Murtha uh, on that when he was uh, back in the back well, Thank you, and we'll, we'll work on it. Thanks, Rob. Ms. Florine. Uh, well, uh, none of us expected Senator M Mikulski to announce her resignation last week, and um, just coincidentally, we had just done, um, you and I had just done uh, filming of the show No Boundaries, talking about our classic relationships locally and the national level, and, and hearing a lot about, talking a lot about our own personal lives as well as uh, political uh, and governing issues. And you mentioned something uh, uh, about your uh, plan for transportation funding. You want to take a minute to tell us how that's going at this point? In time? Sure. So, uh, thanks for raising that. In May, if the Congress uh, doesn't get its act together, the Federal mm -hmm. Transportation Trust Fund will begin begin to fall short, meaning the revenues coming into it will be not be sufficient to support the ongoing program. I'm not talking about the kind of expanded program to modernize our national infrastructure mm -hmm. the way we should. I'm talking about just you know keeping it going. Keeping it going. <laughs> Keeping it going, the money will will fall short in May. Uh, so, a, a lot of us for years have been proposing that we uh, reform uh, some of our business tax code, especially as it relates to the international tax code, and use some of the proceeds to bring it home to invest uh, here. Now, it's really important that this be done in the right way because if you do it, if you just have a repatriation holiday. It actually is counterproductive because what happens if you just declare a repatriation holiday where people can bring their foreign profits home is that uh, those who want to bring some of them home now will do it. At, and this holiday is, of course, at a much lower tax rate. Instead of the 35 percent corporate rate, it would be a lower rate. So uh, it, w it would send a signal that uh, if you park future profits overseas, you just have to wait long enough for another holiday. In fact, there was a tax holiday in around 2003, 2004, and a lot of people think that one of the one of the reasons people are sitting on two trillion dollars overseas is they're just waiting for another holiday. So it can't just be another holiday. It has to be part of business tax reform, where we change the system uh, in a way that uh, can uh, capture some of uh, that revenue to invest here in the United States on an ongoing basis, uh, but also do it in a way that um, ensures that the businesses want to, you know, invest uh, here at home. So it has to be done in the right way, but the President has now put forward a proposal very much uh, like what a number of us have been talking about, and uh, his proposal would bring back a significant amount of money, enough to fund the Transportation Trust Fund for about four years at a much higher, at a higher level. So not just, it's a four-year program, not just a current services program. Um, to invest. So, I, I, so let me say this. <laughs> That's not likely to happen by May. <laughs> um, and so the question will be whether Congress comes up with a sort of short-term stopgap measure that, and that time is used productively to try to get this longer-term uh, 
answer, response, or whether it's a short-term, uh, you know, it's kick the can down the road, and then when you get down the road a little bit, it's just kick the can right. down a road right. again, which is what we hope to avoid, but has been, has been the pattern. So thanks for your work. Ms. Navarro. Thank you. Um, well, speaking about uh, some geopolitical issues, I just have two, <laughs> two sure. uh, items. One of them is geopolitical. Uh, is this conversation around Cuba. I hope also that you will pay close <coughs> attention to what's happening in Venezuela. Yes. Very much a very similar situation. We've been there, seen that movie, see what's happened in Cuba, and uh, hopefully we don't need another, you know, 40 plus years of trying to yeah. uh, work something there, especially because it's, as we know, a part has been a partner with the largest uh, proven oil reserves in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Really a very difficult situation. Personally witnessed that in December when I went to see my young father, and it's, it's a, it should be a real yeah. concern for us here in the hemisphere. Um, the other issue, though, around education, you're talking about, you know, the prospects of this budget. Uh, very interesting that the Republicans seem to be focusing on, on, on wanting to cut. We're hearing positive news around our economy, um, but the issue around education is a real concern, especially locally. Um, as, as you know, we're in the middle of a search of a new superintendent. There have been a lot of concerns about the achievement gap and the yes. impact that that's going to have also on our bottom line and workforce development and our future economic viability. Um, and just curious to know, you know, where do you see that going um, and what prospects are there to also reframe this issue of the achievement gap as a socioeconomic imperative and not always seen as just this political football around, you know, um, progressive values versus conservative, et cetera. It seems like it should be a bipartisan issue given the yeah. workforce, uh, you know, composition of the workforce in 5, 10, 15 years. So just wondering yeah. what yeah. are some of the uh, angles that are being uh, tossed around right now. Uh, in sure. Well, first, thanks for your uh, long-time uh, advocacy and work on education. Right? And um, so let me just say a word about Venezuela first. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I look forward to your observations. I mean, if it's a it's a really awful yes. situation mm -hmm. uh, right now, and you know everyone had you know great hopes uh, for Venezuela. This is obviously a big step back Absolutely. that we're seeing. But um, so on education, um, it, it's remarkable how things that are pretty bipartisan or nonpartisan in the county or even in the state mm -hmm. during my time in the state when we worked I did a lot of work on. On education issues, how they become more polarized mm -hmm. uh, in the Congress. Uh, and the biggest example of that is this uh, House Education <laughs> Bill. It's the reauthorization of the ESEA bill, right, the elementary and secondary uh, legislation. And, uh, you know, the senior Democrat on the <laughs> Education Committee is Bobby Scott. He's been doing a great job. Um, but he's pointed out that the bill that's coming to the floor of the House, actually they brought it to the floor, they had the delay of vote. Uh, but is really a huge step backwards, right? So they remove maintenance effort requirements, which means that, um, you know, the extra dollars don't have to go to education. Um, they actually change the formula that requires that, uh, you know, funds be directed to needier schools, right? I mean, the whole idea of federal education support, like state federal, is to try to change the sort of inherent <laughs> inequities that schools in our country are funded through property taxes, right? right? And so, you know, areas that have higher wealth and higher property taxes are able to support, you know, invest more in schools. And the state and the federal government are supposed to make sure that kids who don't necessarily come from communities with high property taxes, are, their, their needs are, are met just as fully. Uh, unfortunately, this, this bill is a step backwards. Now, in the Senate, there is some hope. Uh, that there will be some bipartisan legislation. I think there's general agreement that the No Child Left Behind legislation had some important parts, but that uh, there are lots of it, a lot of parts that need to be reformed. So hopefully with your input, we can work in Congress to get a good product. On the funding, you know, our, the budget that um, we'll put forward, like the President's budget, has a big investment in early education. Uh, and uh, it also has um, significant investment in workforce training. And one of the things we're looking at is to provide some uh, tax incentives for businesses to invest in apprenticeship programs. 
and develop community college partnerships. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so I'm hoping that area you mentioned, Nancy, workforce training, mm -hmm. for the reasons you said, has some <laughs> bipartisan mm -hmm. uh, support. I, we, don't, we don't know yet, but we're, we're trying to get there. But thank you. I think it's, I mean, the workforce training issues are obviously hugely mm -hmm. important uh, here. And because um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the jobs, it's, it's good that more and more jobs are being created, but a lot of the new jobs that are being created are uh, fairly low-wage mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we need to, we, we need to make sure people have the skills mm -hmm. to get the Sorry. higher paying jobs. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to continue on that set of issues with making sure that families can support themselves and the middle class, what, what are some of the key agenda items that you have I know you recently worked on an economic action plan. Uh, yeah. What are some of the key policies that you think would help the middle class you know, feel more secure? So, yeah, thanks for asking that. You know, look, one, one, as you know, one of the things that's really dramatic uh, is that the gap between growing worker productivity, which has been growing at a pretty rapid rate since the late 1970s, the gap between that and wages has been flat. So you've had, since the late 1970s, worker productivity's gone straight up. Real wages for most workers, flat. So this is the paycheck squeeze, the middle class squeeze. So people feel like they're working harder than ever, they're more productive than ever, but they feel like they're on a treadmill or, or sometimes just falling, falling back. So what do you do about it? And there, there are no easy answers, uh, but there are some things I believe we can do. So one is to actually change our tax code in a way that incentivizes corporations to increase wages. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that there's more spending done through the tax code every year than we do spend on Social Security. Mm -hmm. huh. What is spending in the tax code? It's 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 as a result of all the tax breaks and loopholes, deductions, credits. Now, some of them are for good purposes, right, like incentivizing retirement savings. Some of them are to give uh, tax breaks for depreciation for racehorses, corporate jets, uh, hedge fund managers. And when economists look at those things, they all add up. And if you add up the value of all those tax breaks, it is more per year <laughs> than what we spend on Social Security, Medicare. So that's why we have tax credit. So my my view is we, if we're going to use the tax code uh, for uh, things like corporate jets, we, we should not be doing. Surely we can use the tax code to incentivize higher wages. And so one of the bills I put in, introduced, and it was the first uh, bill that the Democrats uh, called up for a vote this year, was something called the CEO Employee. Paycheck Fairness Act. And what it said was, if corporations are going to deduct the bonuses and so-called performance pay they give to their themselves over a million dollars, then they have to be giving their employees a wage increase that reflects worker productivity inflation. So if you're a corporation and you, uh, you know, pay your CEO and your top executives two zillion dollars in bonuses, Go ahead, but you don't get a tax deduction <laughs> for it. You don't get that subsidized unless you're giving your employees a wage. So it's a way to complement. I mean, the minimum wage is, is hugely important. It, it helps lower wage workers. But what we're trying to do is also provide an incentive to increase wages higher up the income scale. The other part of the proposal is to uh, recognize that our tax code currently uh, rewards those who make money off of money <laughs> rather than more than people who make money off of work mm -hmm. right so we have <laughs> we have a system where the tax rate on, you know, on capital gains <coughs> is lower than the top income tax rate so what the president's proposed is simply taking the capital gains rate back to where it was during when President Reagan was president and also dealing with what they what's called the trust fund loopholes, um, and, and and this is way people can pass on massive amounts of wealth at death without capturing the appreciation of the value 
of the assets. So what we're trying to do, Hans, is uh, actually change the tax code to provide um, uh, more uh, tax relief to middle class families and people who are working their way to the middle class and close some of those special interest tax breaks uh, in the tax code. And those tax breaks that, as I said, reward money made from money more than money made from work. That's, that's right. I, I just have to say, you always do such a good job of explaining complex issues in plain English. And you've seen that in evidence here. And these are very complex topics, but you always lay them out very clearly in a way that's easy for constituents to follow. Thanks, Mr. Rice. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about uh, Selma. And uh, not just the movie, but the anniversary. Uh, yes. We just came off of the state of Black Montgomery on Saturday, uh, where we That's really right. talked about uh, a number of, the th of things that are happening within the black community uh, throughout this nation. You know, it's not unique just to Montgomery County. And so I'm curious as to uh, when it comes to voting rights legislation, seeing what Oregon has done uh, and seeing that uh, at a state level. But I'd really like to see the federal government start to move towards pushing and facilitating uh, for more folks uh, to be involved in uh, the voting process, because I think then you'd have a more reflective government that's representative uh, of its communities. You know, we tout ourselves about diversity here in the state of Maryland and here in Montgomery County, but we still struggle with that representative diversity that still reflects what we're seeing in our communities. And so I'm curious as to whether or not you think that with the current makeup of Congress, uh, whether or not there'll be any movement in terms of responding to what we've seen with Supreme Court's actions, yeah. uh, and whether or not we'll see some development on the other side in terms of legislation. Uh, but then also, what is it that we're going to continue to do to really try and push for uh, that more inclusive and reflective type of government? Right. Well, first a word about Selma, right? It's the 50th anniversary. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I encourage everybody to see the movie. And if you haven't been down, uh, to Selma um, as part of one of the um, anniversary uh, pilgrimages. I encourage you to do that. I've, I've gone to Selma three times um, and walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with John Lewis, uh, who of course was led the march. And I made sure that each time I took one of my three kids and it was a, an incredible, moving, emotional, and learning experience for all of them. I mean, they were all transformed in a way because of the, you know, the power of taking you back to that moment where people were shedding blood and getting beaten for their right to vote. Um, and uh, it is it is really, uh, it is incredibly troubling to see uh, the Supreme Court decision turning back uh, a big part of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I was part of the, I was on the Senate, on the House Judiciary Committee uh, at the time, and we took lots of testimony. The record was really clear that we needed to continue the pre-clearance process uh, for certain states and jurisdictions. Um, and yet the court ignored all that uh, evidence. They overturned a bill that had been reauthorized by huge majorities in the Senate, like close to 98 votes, overwhelming bipartisan, uh, which is not, <laughs> as we talked, not, to, not that usual, <laughs> bipartisan votes in the House. They overturned it by by judicial fiat. And the, re the result is, shortly thereafter, a lot of the states that were covered by the pre-clearance process began to take actions to roll back uh, access uh, to the ballot box to put up uh, barriers. Um, you know, not as blatant uh, as the, some of the barriers from the past, but still clearly designed to reduce participation, right? So not winning in the democratic process by addition, but trying to win through subtraction, which is cynical. And so uh, we, are, we have introduced legislation to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act, taking into account the things the court claimed uh, were flawed. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't know its prospects. I, 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 our hope is that some of our colleagues who just visited Selma over the weekend will come back 
and see how important it is um, uh, to do this. The other aspect of this, of course, is through the court system. And so I think the Attorney General's, Attorney General Holder has done a really good job trying to be case, bring cases in these uh, under a different section of the Voting Rights Act. Um, but th then we, got, we just have to be um, vigilant about making sure that states <laughs> open participation. We've got early voting here in Maryland. Mm -hmm. That's right. It means a lot more people can participate. Other states are trying to roll that back, as we know, North Carolina and other states. Again, it, we got to fight the cynical uh, effort. Um, and so we're hoping the voting rights uh, reauthorization passes. In the meantime, we just got to keep going. And ultimately, we just got to let people know, you know, we, you got to get out to vote. And we have a responsibility to make sure we do more at the grassroots level That's right. to get out of vote. You know, having grown up overseas many, many years where people hunger to have the right to vote, it is always tough to see people who have that right not exercising that right to vote. So, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Katz? Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and Chris, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for all that you do, obviously, but I also want to thank you for your staff. Because, you. Uh, you know, many times they don't get the applause that they should, but I know right. constituent service has always been huge for you and your office. And, and uh, I know that on a first-hand level, I've seen it, and, and I, I know many, many people have seen it as well. But I guess my question is about Social Security. Is it, is it the great concern that we read about every now and then, or is it something that, that, uh, that there's going to be a handle on? So um, before I answer that, I do want to thank my team and Joe Clinton. I look right at her when I say <laughs> that. Right and they really thank you. They, they do a great job. Yeah. It's all, you know, when, whenever we're uh, not able to get stuff done in Congress, which is unfortunately too often, I, I take satisfaction in the ability to be able to help people. No, people are really struggling with problems, you know, you know, getting evicted from their home, not getting Social Security, immigration issues. So, anyway, thank you. Um, so, look, I mean, Social Security is uh, one of the greatest social programs we've got. I mean, obviously grew out of a period of time when people were destitute in their uh, elder years. Uh, and you know, it was one of those American great ideas from Franklin Roosevelt. We need to make sure we strengthen it uh, going going forward. And it has been strengthened over, over time. Um, the current uh, situation with respect to Social Security is that there are um, is enough in the trust fund uh, to keep Social Security solvent through the year about 2033. After that, if Congress does nothing, uh, then Social Security would pay 75 cents on the dollar. So Congress has got to uh, take some action before then, and you know the sooner we figure out a way to do it, the, the, the less um, you know big the change will have to be uh, when it's done. A lot of us have uh, put forward uh, proposals uh, to deal with it, um, including uh, suggested dedicating a portion of the estate tax to the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, there are also ways to raise the um, Social Security tax on the higher income levels. Um, the President at one point had what we call the uh, approach um, where you would, uh, you know, Increase you, you'd essentially apply the social security tax, but at a you know hopscotch up to a higher uh, yeah. point on the uh, income mm -hmm. uh, scale. Uh, so those are those are some of the things that can be be done. Which the, we 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 should, but again, I mean, bottom line is that you know it's um, helped keep millions of Americans out of it's one of the most successful anti-poverty programs in the United States. Not often thought about it that way because yep. it's been with us so long. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's what allows seniors to have a decent life. Yep. Uh, life in their elder years. I want to Thank actually you. interject on that point, Congressman, because you know, as as you're aware, I want to come to your defense on the on that issue because one of the distinguishing things that is being said now in the Senate race is that you had not is is that your record on Social Security was somehow, you know, not as strong as the Democrats should be, but in fact, anything that keeps the Social Security Trust Fund solvent will involve some adjustments and some small amount of sacrifice for some people. So my perception of the role that you've always played is to be very focused on advancing the discussion and working both sides of the aisle. And that's going to lead, as it has, to, you know, you're getting a little bit of chatter from the populist left saying that you were 
you know, not defending Social Security. In fact, my recollection is you were very much defending Social Security, but it has to be uh, the, the system needs to be shored up, and that's going to take an investment of resources, and somehow something will happen that won't be universally popular, but it's to your credit that you have been willing to take that on. Well, thanks. We need to, look, we need to strengthen uh, big parts of the Social Security system. Right now, um, for very low-income seniors, the benefit they get um, is really not adequate uh, to have them at a decent uh, standard of living. And so there have been a number of proposals um, to, to address uh, that issue. But yet, yeah, look, you know, we all got to get together and, and figure, th those who want to make sure that we're strengthening Social Security, they've got to come together with constructive proposals uh, to do that. I just threw out a couple of ideas of how you could address right. some of those yeah. issues. Mr. Ellis. You've had an amazing, amazingly challenging job where you are. And I, and I really appreciate the work you've done on that. Um, I wonder, um, you know, a lot of proposals that, that people think are common sense, whether it's wage increases or, or health care reform, actually benefit small businesses, can benefit small businesses in the right context. There was some article out of Bloomberg where they basically said, you know what, the minimum wage wasn't such a bad thing because they talked about how much it costs to train new employees mm -hmm. with great yeah. frequency, and they're discovering, well, the more I pay people, the longer they stay because they don't go anywhere. And yet the Democrats seem unable to pry loose small business people from the embrace of people like the Koch brothers. And so business seems to march in lockstep even when what's good for corporations who pay no taxes is not in the, at all in the interest of small businesses. We see it at the state where they want to do combined reporting. The guy who owns a shop in the corner is unaffected by combined reporting. The more revenue I bring in from people who are not combined reporting means I need to tax the guy in the corner less. Right. less. Right. They make no connection. Right. So how does the Democratic Party figure out a message and a way of talking to these folks and saying, we are not your enemy and we are not your problem? So you're, you're right. Look, I think a lot of... Um, I mean, small businesses obviously are the engine of our economy. I mean, they're growing fast. I mean, people have pretty tight margins in some small business. Now, there are some small businesses that might be law firm partnerships that can do very well, but, you know, your normal mom and pop Main Street uh, small business. Um, I think we, we have to work harder and, um, you know, be clear about how the policies we're presenting um, benefit small businesses. The Small Business Administration, the loan program, um, I hear lots of stories about how some great business started yep. with a loan from the Small Business Administration, right? Um, and you know, somehow that seems to get lost in, in translation. That obviously is government playing some role in trying to uh, make sure that people have access to credit uh, to start a small business. The Affordable Care Act is another example. I actually have heard in the last couple of days from a number of small businesses who came up to thank me for the Affordable Care Act because before the Affordable Care Act, they couldn't get coverage uh, for their employees. So I think, you know, it's one of those things that over time when people begin to recognize that, hey, actually it's providing an opportunity for me to uh, provide health insurance to my employees at a much lower cost. Um, it's a good thing. As uh, the President says, uh, the day that happens, they will go from calling it Obamacare to <laughs> calling it the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I do hear more of that from small business. And in fact, the Affordable Care Act, for very small businesses, it's a great tax credit. I mean, just to be clear, if you have 50 employees or less, you don't have any obligation on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but you do have the benefit right. of some tax credits. That's right. Uh, for your employees. So it's been part of this massive disinformation mm -hmm. campaign. So we do have to do a better job of countering <clears throat> the disinformation and then talking about um, ways we can help small business. By the way, it also allows entrepreneurs, young people, to not have be stuck in a job simply because yeah. that job offered health insurance. You know, it used to be before the Affordable Care Act, the only way you could access a government subsidy for your health care was through employer. There is a subsidy, right? I mean, the subsidy is the employer mm -hmm. that doesn't, you don't get taxed on your benefit. But if you're self-employed, 
<laughs> you don't you don't get that benefit on the Affordable Care Act because you can get a tax credit depending on your income. You can get your tax credit, go into the exchange, get health insurance, start your own business. So it really, I think, over time, you know, I, I think, you know, people we, we we've not done a good enough job of sort of explaining the benefits, but I think the benefits are becoming more clear every day to more people. You have the classic example of when the Republicans use the phrase death panels. Yeah. When well. the reality is that insurance companies are death panels yeah. every day because we all know about cases where people were denied insurance <laughs> for a particular treatment and right. they die. So first, first they're the people who are denied coverage because they have pre-existing condition, and then the people who pay more to get it and still when it comes time for coverage, it's like, oh, get out your magnifying glass, mm -hmm. right? So. And, and the whole provision of allowing, you know, people's kids to stay on their parents' insurance policy until age 26 provides huge, you know, health security for, for young people. So, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep working on that. Excellent. Well, it's always good to see you. We appreciate you making the time. Thank you all. It's great working with each and, one of, each and every one of you and uh, your offices. So. All right. Look forward to Thank continuing you. our Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.